The next step in the strategic workforce planning process is to identify the gaps. In strategic workforce planning, there are essentially two types of gaps. The first is a headcount gap. In the previous section, you saw that we were building headcount models to project the anticipated number of employees that we would need in the future. These models were based on the scenarios we selected, plus anticipated factors related to growth or decline of the business, efficiency gains, and possible consolidations or acquisitions. The second type of gap, which we have not yet discussed, is a skill set gap. You can have the right number of headcount, but have the wrong skills in certain job roles. This comes up more frequently in areas that are impacted by, say, rapidly moving technology. The IT space moves so quickly that programming languages and other aspects that we learn today may actually be outdated five years from now. So now what do we do with this information? We are heading into the final step for strategic workforce planning, which is to establish the action plans to close the identified gaps. If the gap we have is related to headcount, then potential action plans are related to internal and external recruitment in order to get enough headcount for the future. If we're looking at the opposite and we're forecasting that our headcount needs for the future are actually lower than they are today, then the action plans are going to be related to downsizing and possible redundancies. On the other hand, if the gap we're trying to close is related to skill sets, then we're getting more into the decisions related to building and developing talent. Should we do internal training? Is it part of our own talent management project? Should we buy the talent on the outside of the company? Should we outsource it to contractors in case it's a skill set that perchance we only need for the next six months? When it comes to setting action plans to close the skill set gap, you will often find that you're not sure whether you want to build the talent, buy the talent, or borrow the talent. In my work, I found that it was useful to build this template that you see on the screen to try and put a cost on the three options. If you're not sure about the difference between build, buy, or borrow, I've actually put the definitions inside this template. Build means that we're going to develop the talent we need internally. So we are going to grow employees from their current roles into the more difficult roles that we're trying to fill. Buy means that we're going to recruit permanent employees from the outside labor market. Borrow means that we will hire temporary contractors or freelancers. To try and put a cost on option one, which is build, we will build that talent internally, I've developed this section of the template. Now the advantage to building is that it creates a non-traditional career path option for employees and those employees already have internal working relationships within your company. The disadvantage to building is that it may take longer than you can afford to wait. For that reason, I've actually put a time component on the table below. Inside this table, we can actually start to log the number of people in the roles that we think that we could grow into the role that we're trying to fill. Then we estimate the percent of people in these roles that can or are willing to learn the new role that we're trying to put them into. It then calculates the number of people that are truly available to fill the job role that you need. And the final column is the time component. How long would this development take? Based on this rough estimate that's in the table, you can then determine whether you think that you can train enough people in time to meet your needs. So in the table below, I've tried to give you some ideas of typical categories of costs that are associated with developing skill sets in employees. It's then going to take the number of people from the table above and try to roll up the total cost of training those people. Now if we keep scrolling down in the template, I've given you a buy option. That means we're going to recruit the talent from the outside labor market. Now the advantage to the buy option is that it can be faster than building internal talent. The disadvantage is that it often has a higher cost and new employees tend to have higher turnover and they have no internal relationships to leverage to get things done. 
Another disadvantage is that it can be viewed negatively by current employees if you choose to buy talent on the outside versus actually promoting people from within. The buy option also comes with associated costs. So the template tries to give you an idea on how you can calculate the cost of hire. There's a rule of thumb out there that kind of says there's a certain percentage of a person's base salary that represents the cost to hire. The higher that position is, the greater percentage of their base salary is interpreted to be the total cost of hire. So what I've put in this table is a list of the positions and the levels and the associated rule of thumb for that calculation. For example, if the job role that you're trying to fill is at the clerical level, so a fairly low level, the rule of thumb is that 50% of the base salary is the typical cost of hire. So in that first example, if that salary is typically $50,000 and our rule of thumb says that the cost to hire is about 50% of that, then our cost of hire is $25,000 for each person that we need to put in that level. So as the higher you go up, you can see as you look down the rows in this table, it's going to scale up the percentage for the cost of hire to give you a rough estimate of the total cost that it would take for you to use the buy option. Scrolling down, we have a small section representing the borrow option. The advantage to borrowing talent is that it can often be obtained on the open labor market faster than onboarding an employee, and you can flex this talent upward and downward as your needs change. The disadvantage is that these workers do not have internal relationships to leverage. They would have to slowly build them. This option is similar to option two, the buy option, but if the talent needs are uncertain, you may wish to hire contractors or freelancers to have the ability to flex the workforce downward just in case you need to do so. The final portion on this page of the template is the strategic decision. So this is where you make your final decision by looking at all the information above to see whether you actually want to build your talent buy your talent, or you may actually decide that you need a combination of the two. This template is designed that you can record your recommendation in the box at the base of the spreadsheet. Now you may be wondering what this second tab is all about. So we've already discussed build, buy, or borrow, but I've got an extra tab called redeploy. In many large companies, it's not unusual that even if the entire company is growing, there are always small subsections of the company that are shrinking or are becoming obsolete. For this reason, I've got a second tab for the downsizing or elimination of certain job roles. So when you're doing strategic workforce planning, you are not only interested in the roles of interest, the specialized roles, the critical roles, whatever terminology you choose to use, but you're also interested in looking at areas of the company where things like technology are actually going to make some positions either obsolete or it's going to reduce the workload of those positions. You can take a look at page two on this template and use this as a guide to set a redeployment plan. I'm going to place a copy of this spreadsheet in the resources section. You're welcome to download it and modify it to make it work for your own company's needs. You can leverage your headcount models for additional value inside other areas of the company. For example, you can sometimes send your headcount model over to IT, especially in professional companies, because they can use the headcount projection to project the number of computers and software licenses that they need in the future. That's just one example. I've also sent headcount numbers over to the finance department for them to use for budgeting the future cost of the workforce. Additionally, some companies use the headcount model to start to project the real estate or the capacity that they're going to need, so the actual office space that they're trying to plan. This concludes the description of the five step strategic workforce planning process. I hope that this class has provided enough information to get you started. The remaining sections of this class are optional. They provide examples of workforce planning projects 
some considerations if you are trying to set up workforce planning globally, and some advice on how to get started.